This next speaker, Mark Brown, up until about 25 minutes ago, would have been the most wonderful person I've never met. So I've, we've connected a few times via email. He's just up at the back there. Um, and now I can say he's, he's one of the most wonderful people I have, have yeah. ever met. In fact, he's so wonderful. You were on the Times Happy List last year, weren't you? Independent, Independent Happy List, sorry, yeah. Sorry. Um, Mark, up from 2007 to 2014. Um, sorry, just trying to change the order, but we're not going to. Uh, from 2007 to 2014, was editor of One in Four magazine, which is a mental health magazine where um, all the content was written by people with mental health difficulties. He now runs um, A Day in the Life. I don't know if you're familiar with A Day in the Life, but Google it, it's brilliant. It's um, a website whereby four days um, across the year, people with mental health difficulties um, write about what that day has been like for them and how they've experienced it. Mark does loads of other digital innovation, mental health related stuff, is I think how you like to describe it, isn't it? And is um, an all round brilliant person. I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say today. So, uh, welcome Mark. Also on, on Twitter, Mark184. Hi, So I sort of trail off into sort of insensibility. Um, put your hand up and go speak up. Um, I'd like to begin this morning by saying that right now there's a lot of people losing hope out there. If clinical psychology is the industry of the promotion of human well-being, there's a lot of people in the UK at the minute in need of your goods and services. I'm a person who experiences mental health difficulties, but I'm also someone who gets to sneak into situations like this and make a couple of points. So this morning, I've been asked to talk to you about what happens when clinical psychology gets out of the therapy room. So, first, a little scene setting. Imagine this is a sort of pre-credits <coughs> sequence where the camera zooms across the landscape, giving us a view of the scale and scope of the story we're about to see unfold. In just what kind of landscape is this therapy room situated? Who are its inhabitants? What are their story? Home, your own suitably stirring theme music at the moment, or perhaps if you're less certain about the direction I'm taking, you can hum the Benny Hill theme tune. <laughs> so, the scene people with long term mental health difficulties are some of the most vulnerable people in society, and we hate it. We hate feeling that so much of our life depends on policy made in white or, or discussed in number 10. We can't pull off a magic trick and become un not unwell. Even when we're doing well, it's often because we're getting the right help. That isn't an argument for the removal of that help, it's an argument for its continuation. While mental health is an issue, it's developed a growing profile in the public debate. Little has risen above the, be nicer to people with mental health difficulties, more hospitals level. Whether the focus on mental health sticks will depend on whether a new government cares enough about mental health to do the one thing that a government can do apart from passing laws. It depends on whether they're prepared to spend money. It's easy to look like savings are being made if you find ways of shifting the costs off the balance sheet. It's always possible to shift the costs of not investing in mental health and mental well-being off the balance sheet to say it's the fault of individuals for not getting better, not making the best of what's on offer. Mental health isn't just something that is about treatment. For those of us who experience difficulties with our mental health, there's, some, there's something that tends to seep into all <coughs> the areas of our life. In common with other disabilities, mental health difficulties tend to make many areas of life more difficult. The ways in which those areas are difficult depend on the world that we live in and the people who are around us. Strong social protections, benefits that offset the various hardships that come from having difficulties with your mental health, strong rights to treatment, support and to quality of life, all these things safeguard the well-being of people with mental health difficulties. While mental health difficulty might happen in our heads, the solutions and causes are not purely in the individual. Not having a mental health difficulty means that you're more likely to end up poor, for instance. What it means to be poor changes depending on the prevailing political and social winds of the time. Mental health difficulty can often make you feel vulnerable because you are having difficulties. Because when you're having difficulties, you're more at the mercy of the prevailing winds of society that you live in. Having a mental health difficulty makes things more difficult, in short. The fact that with the right support out and changes in certain senses, some of us will be able to gain and stay in employment is used to suggest that others 
bother sort of malingerers, or that we're just not trying hard enough. Many people have mental health difficulties have lost the sense that it's possible to trust this, or any government, to put their rights on the agenda. People have seen the accessibility of treatment they need reduced, seen the benefits they're receiving both in work and out of work dwindle, seen the fabric of local voluntary and security services and organisations fray, and in some places in the country collapse. Mental health began austerity in conditions of underinvestment. When someone first falls ill or is having problems, our automatic response is to say, there should be someone out there to help with this. But increasingly, as cuts hollow out social protections, regardless of whether they are provided by the private, public or the voluntary sector, people are finding that the help that everyone thought should be there just isn't. What I've seen and experienced myself is that everyday life with a mental health difficulty is often a struggle, one that isn't obvious, isn't headline grabbing, but one that makes a mess of lives if there isn't support for help and protections. <coughs> Those messes and people's lives tend to get worse. When we live with mental health difficulties for a while, the hope is that the crises will be further apart, that help and support will make sure that we don't lose sight of what we want our lives to be about. When we've got the right treatment, the right support, enough money to live on, and a balance between stretching ourselves and feeling safe, even then we're often just managing to keep our heads above water. The margin between doing okay and not doing okay can be very, very slim. Even a tiny policy change can tip life from being manageable into life being impossible. Even when everything is in place, we can still become ill. <coughs> Mental health difficulties tend to be treacherous like that. When that happens, we need to feel that it's possible to access help quickly before everything we've managed to build up is washed away. But remember, mental health and treatment and support needs to be a partnership. You can't do mental health to people. It's not a pull your socks up situation. This government needs to rebuild that lost trust if it's to get anywhere with people with mental health difficulties. As much as we may want to be self-reliant, we also have to rely on the society that we live in. Many people feel this acutely. People are scared and worried that what little security we've managed to achieve in the face of mental health conditions that make a mess of things might be swept away by a single policy announcement on any given morning on the Today programme on Radio 4. That might be it. That's what's done for. So an edit to a cell in a spreadsheet, a tiny shift in policy focus from one aim to another can absolutely screw the life up if you have a mental health difficulty. Your policy is my life. If the scale of cuts suggested is to be put into action, the human costs of those cuts aren't collateral damage. The human costs of those cuts are the core business of any government, the duty to protect its citizens and subjects. And for many of us who feel closest to those cuts, the prevailing wind is bringing not a warm breeze of spring, but a harsh chill of never-ending winter. And on that I'm just going to quick mouthful of water. So, that's our scene set. Didn't hear any Benny Hill team, so I'm assuming it's going on Some, not all, of the people of this wonderful land are losing hope. But what the role, what's the role for our glorious saviour, clinical psychology in this? Where does she fit? Discussions about mental health and well-being during times of austerity often become discussions about preserving the front line. We're watching ideas of a mental wellness service slowly changing into a mental illness service. And then, not even that. It's all about the front line. Save the front line. Hold the front line. But just where is the front line in mental health and well-being? Can we really, given the fact that the front line is a military metaphor, really reduce the battle against mental illness and the battle for mental health to a series of dug-in trenches where we battle fixed enemies until they're gone? I think the front line of mental health is a bit more complicated. The front line of well-being even more so. So is this front line in the mental health inpatient ward, wards across the country where treatment is provided for people who are very ill? Is it in the community mental health teams where people's needs in theory are met in the community? Is it in GP surgeries where people first turn when they're unwell? Is it in the social services departments where people receive help and support with the complicated challenges that can come with a mental health difficulty? Or is it in social care services? Is this frontline in the community organisations that provide support, advice, encouragement and inspiration to people with mental health difficulties? Is it in the HR departments of companies trying to find the best way of supporting their employees who experience mental health difficulties? Is it at neighbourhood advice services? 
where many people look for support with issues in their life that affect their mental health. In the consulting rooms of therapists or counsellors, where people explore what's troubling them. Or is it in the casework of advocates and the meetings of service user representatives? And it goes on. Is it in the back to work providers and job centres? Or is it in the benefit decision making bodies? Is it, is it in the offices and premises of small and large charities? Or in the activities they carry out? Is it in the media or the communications departments, places that provide services and support? Or research teams and campaigning groups? Or is it in the advice and support helplines and websites and new technologies or ways of keeping in touch? Is it in accident and emergency? Is it in any place where people with mental health difficulties try to find solutions to their own problems? Is it in our homes or workplaces and in our relationships with people? I think the front line of mental health and wellbeing is everywhere. Because mental health and wellbeing happens where people and the environments in which they find themselves interact with each other backwards and forwards all the time. There's nothing that doesn't have a bearing on mental health and wellbeing. For clinical psychology, the entire world is outside of the therapy room. But what should you do? The therapy room is really safe. People pay you money to do a job, and you do it. But you want to do more. Your conscience tells you that there is more that can be done. But what? If clinical psychology wants to step out of the therapy room and provide a service to the people of this country and to the people of the world, it needs to work out where best to help and how best to do so. Clinical psychology is not just a field of work. It's also a field of knowledge and experience and skills. All of you who can describe yourself as clinical psychologists have tied up in you a huge pile of different resources that can be put to uses other than the thing that you get your paycheck for at the end of the month. Through the work we've been trained for and the work we feel confident in carrying out, we shall redeem the world from its fallen state. If we just had more clinical psychologists and everything, then eventually you wouldn't need clinical psychologists because everyone would be better, eventually. While it's entirely understandable to feel that the work we do is indispensable to champion its role in the world, it's not correct to see that as the only way that we can make use of our skills to make change happen. In part, this way of thinking comes from being unable to see what clinical psychology might contribute beyond staying in the therapy room where it's comfortable. There's always an interesting thing that happens. I've seen it happen in every single discussion of the future of mental health, from dystopian visions of psychologically tortured ghost people walking mechanically around an ultra-consumption-based techno-dictatorship to post discussions of a post-scarcity future where every person can unlock their inner potential, overcome their trauma and awake each morning as a fully actualized human being, leaping out of bed to carry out superhuman feats of compassion and productivity and artistry. Regardless of the tone, regardless of the context, the conclusion is always the same. We need, what we need is more people from our profession doing the jobs our profession does. But to what ends should we put those resources that we have apart from that? How would you decide? I think there's a number of things we need to think about. Clinical psychology and well-being of people, both collectively and individually, do not happen in a vacuum. So let's just start just outside of the therapy room first. What's out there? If you edge the door open and just kind of peer around the gap in the corridor. What's outside the door is the organisations that people work in, of course, which are also the organisations that people use. And people are losing trust in the idea that they might ever have lives that are better. And they're looking at lives that seem to be getting progressively worse. They've lost hope. It's so just outside the therapy room door. Just think about the organisations you work in. If we ask ourselves questions about services in which some of us work, we often ask them in terms of how can we make sure this service helps people more. When we're talking about hope, I think it's more instructive to ask in what ways might this service make us make people worse by removing the hope that they have that things can be better. Regardless of what service an organisation is providing, it has the capacity to either give hope or take hope away. In many senses, people take a risk in hoping that services will be able to help them. In other words, they place their trust in services. So then, hope that you can help be helped is an act of trust. And based on my attempts to define hope, but the extent to which you receive positive reinforcement of that trust defines how likely you are to remain hopeful. Services often forget that while their job might only begin when someone arrives at the door, it actually represent, represents the end of a journey of hope for the person who's just arrived in front of them. They've turned up precisely because they hope that service will be able to help them. At that point on, the service can either support and nourish the hope that someone feels, 
or it can take a series of witting or unwitting actions to stunt or completely snuff out that hope. Services can dispel hope in a thousand ways. One new member of reception staff can undo a week of therapy. A couple of unreturned phone calls can leave someone feeling ignored. A badly worded letter can give entirely the wrong impression of what might happen. All of these things are relegated to the satisfaction surveys because satisfaction surveys only ask whether the service is serving its purpose, not how it serves its purpose. They're, they're the cumulative effect of services that forget they're actually working for people. Kind of, this kind of thing happens because there is a diffused responsibility for making sure that people have the best experience that they can with the service and what it offers. They're especially prevalent in services that themselves feel lacking in hope, services that feel ignored, overworked, misunderstood, unrewarded. Services that don't believe things can be better <coughs> tend to communicate that belief to people who trust them to make things better. Thank you. When individuals raise issues with the organisations that they use, the despairing organisation rejects them as criticism rather than recognise them as offers to provide advice about ways in which they can stop destroying people's hope. Low expectations and unreasonably high expectations can remove hope from people. Low expectations by actually arguing against someone's hopes and forcing them to question them. Unreasonably high expectations by ignoring the realities of someone's life again, forcing them to question their hopes. When an organisation, usually by imperceptible increments, begins to slide into despair itself, it actually reduces the ability it has to be effective by managing to destroy hope rather than creating it. So clinical psychology can't just relax and say, we are but a cog in a machine. It needs to be asking, what does this machine do? Who made it? Who is controlling this machine? Is this machine even the right machine in the first place? One of the challenges you think about how clinical psychology might better serve society is that it's very hard to think of yourself as a helper, not a leader. More than ever, we need people who can bring understanding into the mainstream of trauma, of difficulty, of sadness, of frustration, of despair, of prejudice, and marginalisation being thwarted at every turn in your, event to have a, in your attempts to have a better life. We need people who can help people with power to understand not just the positive effects of their actions, <coughs> but also the negative effects. We need people to put the humanity back into the understanding of the effects of policy and practice. We need a new generation of public professionals and a resurgence of older ones. We need people powered by psychological knowledge who can hold the world to account and say, hang on, stop that, you're acting like utter dicks. <laughs> <laughs> and a country which seems to many to be either, either be becoming more polarised or more unequal, depending on who you talk to, we need people <coughs> who can speak up for other people's well-being. We need more than ever public professionals who can help us to understand, and public professionals who can help support the legitimacy of the problems raised with society by those with least power and with least other forms of influence. As a professional and as a person, we need more people who listen, speak with respect and care, know their subject, don't talk about the benefits of their work without discussing its limitations, don't think they know everything, who are proud of their job but not blind to its failings, and who are advocates for the best of possible worlds while understanding where the world is at its worst. <coughs> One of the things that needs to happen is that clinical psychology needs to be of this world. It needs to be rooted in the actuality of people's lives. People are glorious, confusing, challenging, infuriating, amazing things. It needs as much as possible, as we say in design, to get out of the office. That's what clinical psychology needs to do. It needs to get out of the office. It needs to hang out with people. If you know me as Mark 1 and 4 on Twitter, which some of you will do, you'll know that social media can be a great place to do some of that hanging out. Clinical psychology is ultimately all about people. But ask yourself, how close do you actually feel to the people your profession is attempting to help? One of the things I've noticed is that often someone will meet a particular group of people who experience mental health difficulty or come across a particular approach developed slightly outside of the mainstream of standard practice, and that for them will become their answer. They get stuck with one perspective that they feel replaces their old authoritarian or inflexible model with a new one. 
this might be their first exposure to the pain or the enthusiasm of a group of people who seem closer to the problem than they do. The wish to do right by these people grows in fervour. I've spoken to service users and this is what they want. This is what they tell me that we should be doing. The newly converted radical will say. But people get stuck having found this radical path. They change from someone questioning and learning and helping to somebody who becomes dogmatic. They become fixated on the truth and rightfulness of this alternative, this user perspective, forgetting that this user perspective is only one view amongst many user perspectives and people views, people's views about what is best or desirable won't be fixed over time. When we don't feel an authentic connection to the people we're trying to help, we're subject to idealisations, to fantasies about what they might want and how they want, how they might want things to be and how, what things they might find helpful. We're subject to our ideologies overtaking our experiences of people. An area of activity that's all about people, we sometimes, for entirely honourable reasons, manage to leave people out of our thinking. In our discomfort with our paternalism, with our authority, we seek to solve our conscience by promoting one service user cause or another, getting stuck in the position of trying to advocate for what was once a radical idea, but which has now or might have been superseded by other ideas that have followed it. In mental health, I've met many people who battle on a daily basis with the gap between their politics and their practice. There's room for table thumpers. There's also room for smooth influencers and committed researchers and people who do any of the tiny day-to-day -day things that add up to making profound changes happen. In mental health, I often see a lot of assertions about how the world should work, which are met with equally emphatic responses about how the world does work. Often this obscures how something could be made to work. Often in mental health, our head tells us to do one thing, but our gut tells us to do an entirely different thing. I've always been surprised by the amount of people who've told me that they've never been able to reconcile their political beliefs with what they do or experience working in mental health. We can often find our discussions agreeably taking flight to a realm of principles and abstractions, taking refuge in debating room victories, embracing academic bun fights. While out in the real world, people try to live decent lives in a world of broken systems, ever-increasing pressures and real unmet needs. It's easy to win an argument in abstract, and it's easy to fail someone in real life. A potential way through this is using well-being as a way to understand the effects of decisions, events and policies on people. But, I'm sorry folks, we've been losing the well-being war, especially in mental health. The Chief Medical Officer, Sally Davis, declared last year in her annual report that she refuses to take a leap of faith and to trust in the idea that attempts in public health to raise the well-being of all will reduce the amount of new cases of mental conditions. Public mental health, where and if it remains after all of those local authority public health cuts, has become about targeted interventions we know work. Fair enough, you might think, until you realise that those targeted interventions are interventions you'll get if you like them or not, based on whether you're on a list of people at risk. As someone at risk, you probably won't be getting any choice about what intervention you get. We're losing the potential for well-being to be used as a prism for understanding the complex effect of, on people of living in what used to be called late capitalism in an austerity committed society. We're losing the chance of being able to evaluate the potential impact of public policies on day-to-day -day well-being of individuals. We've decided, it seems, that it's okay to make someone's life a misery on purpose if we have the angels on our side. We live in a country that's increasingly keen to use psychological techniques. We're increasingly not keen to measure the psychological implications of those techniques. Travelling through the worlds of disruptive innovation and public policy, as I've been doing for the last 20 years, first as a recipient of support and services, and then latterly as someone who's been striving to make some of them happen, it's been impossible to move for dubious applications of psychological principles and ideas. Time for a third sip of water. <laughs> my lips keep sticking to my teeth. <laughs> if you thought it was just a big smile, it's not. It's like. <laughs> <laughs> no. So, dubious applications of psychological principles and ideas. It often seems that once you belong to a category of person who is considered to be a social problem, you are fair game for the deployment of a range of dubious, potentially damaging psychological tricks and schemes. We've seen the weaponization of shame as a means of reducing A&E visits. 
We've seen the process of helping find work increasingly absorb the worst elements of the coaching world. We've seen nudges and gamification and activation, all seen as technologies for, for promoting particular behaviours. We've seen the rise of inventions, projects, programmes and products that are only measuring their bad positive effects, the extent to which they are proving successful or unsuccessful in achieving their stated aims, but which are failing to record or consider the collateral damage to individuals and to communities that results from such activities. The old medical joke about the procedure of <coughs> complete success apart from the patient not surviving rings true too often. Psychology still has a lot of power if it picks its battles well. It's been fascinating to see how much coverage and credence has been given to Lynn Friedley and Robert Stern's positive effect as coercive strategy, conditionality, activation and the role of psychology in UK government workfare pro programmes, published in this month's Medical Humanities, coupled with the British Psychological Society's call for the reform of the work capability assessment. This article has gone some way to legitimising the concerns and experiences of many who are involved in attempting to claim social security benefits and who are not having the best of times interacting with the harsh back to work regime. We have a problem in mental health as we do in society with the question of who is considered to be legitimate in raising problems. We tend to devalue those who experience suffering when they raise points that challenge both our own position and the ideological position we hold them to occupy. In mental health, some flavours of user opinion are afforded more respect than others. We need clinical psychology, wherever it helps, to bring into public disclosure the full range of public discourse, the full range of human emotional responses to the profound challenges our country is going through, not just the ones that fit a particular ideological position. We need allies, not saviours. We may not be comfortable with it, but the words of clinical psychologists still have power. We need clinical psychology to get out of the office and be on the therapy room because we need someone to help make the case for those who are losing out. To do that, we need a clinical psychology that has political understandings, but which is also close enough to people to be able to offer pragmatic support <coughs> to. We need clinical psychology to help make well-being happen by first always, 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 always making sure that it spends enough time with people to be clear where the actual problems are. When clinical psychology can't act directly, it must help to bring into sight the suffering and the difficulties of those who are in need without shaping those needs through abstracting ideological prisms. People need help now, not in the next world. Your speech has disappeared. <laughs> so I shall finish on people who need help now, not in the next world. Um, yeah, it's disappeared. So what you'll be able to do is go online in the next hour and actually look at the full text of the speech because I'll post it up to the hashtag for this event. Um, so that's me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.